I think it's baffling the more I, th I didn't ever really thought about it until someone brought it up to me. I was like, man, it really is baffling. No one, you know, how I know things about how it all works. And like, it doesn't really make sense. You know, like GSL shouldn't have ever really had money issues. They have such a loyal audience, has such a low viewership. Like they could sell so much of whatever they wanted to. Um, hey, so yeah. I see a story in here. Today, I have a video with one of the most important figures in the StarCraft community today, Wardy. Not only does Jonathan cast some of the biggest events in StarCraft 2, he also organizes and manages a number of online events and much else besides. In this long form piece, we got to discuss all of that and more. If you've been enjoying what I do here, get subscribed so you don't miss out on future uploads like this one. And if you really love what I'm doing, consider supporting me on Patreon, the link is in the video description. With that out of the way, let's jump in to my word with Wardy. So Wardy, thank you uh, so much for taking the time today, man. Appreciate it, man. It's uh, always good to talk to people, and especially at Home Story Cup, where we've got such a good community vibe going on. You're always in good spirits to sit down and do some things, you know? Absolutely. Um, so I think my customary question, how'd you first get into StarCraft? Oh, I, I, it's actually been a while since anyone asked me this, but... I actually got into StarCraft because I was on Ventrilo with my WoW guild and they were talking about playing this sick new thing which was not even necessarily StarCraft but they were playing tower defense and I wasn't necessarily into it but the next day I was out and I saw StarCraft on the shelf and I was like okay I'll, I'll pick this up so I can play whatever they're playing and uh, I downloaded it and I played this tower defense game and I was like man this is terrible especially because I didn't know what I was doing right so I was like this sucks so um, in the end I ended up trying to play the game and obviously it's kind of hard to just dive into StarCraft too, right? Like, you know, you gotta, you gotta learn somehow. So tried YouTube and a couple of things and in the end I just, you know, started to play it and I got really into playing it and then I found the esports side of it. And so I just kind of naturally loved it. It just was something amazing that I just hadn't known about before. Were there any particular creators that you discovered early on that like kind of got you into the game? I, love, I watched a lot of like HD and uh, Pain user those guys were like, they, they made a lot of guides and stuff as well right back then. So I definitely watched a lot of those guys. Just the IPL guys in general back in the day is what I watched a lot as well. Like um, Cat's Pajamas and everybody. <laughs> Watching them do the IPTLs. I watched them before I went to bed. That was my favorite thing. Maybe I didn't find those initially, but that was definitely one of my best things. Being able to be like, man, I'm going to bed now and I could just put StarCraft on for a couple of hours at night. That consistency was just, it was awesome, man. Like you always had something to watch. It was really cool. Yeah, no, it's uh, names like Cat's Pajamas, what a throwback. Kevin yeah, Blackman. I know. <laughs> Kevin Nocky nowadays, I think. Yeah. Um, so, what made you get involved with the commentary side of things? So, one day I was reading Team Liquid, and uh, someone had a post on there saying, hey, I'm making a practice group, and it was all about North America, and, you know, if you want to play, you know, and practice on North American servers, then you can join this group, and let, let's make a group. And I was like, man, that sounds really cool. I need this to get better. So I made a similar thread saying, hey guys, you know, let's make a group and uh, let's do this kind of thing on Europe. And I just, I don't know, I, like, let's, I, would, I don't know, I just said, hey, let's call it SC2 Improve. Um, and then obviously that really kicked off. Like this was a chat channel, which was so full. We had to have SC2 Improve 2 and SC2 Improve 3. It was like really a thing. It was where people went to find people to play with. And uh, even nowadays, I mean, it's an archaic thing, but the group system on Battle.net, if you go on there, it's one of the top three biggest groups on the European server. So um, basically from there, you know, we were a practice group and the next thing was like, hey, what else could we do? And we set up a tournament and that got me into some tournament organizing and we teamed up with SCV Rush, which is another name from way back in the day. Um, so with SCV Rush, I kind of just kept admining and helping and eventually it was like, we should stream this and they just kind of went from there. I used to play a bunch of the SCV Russ uh, Bronze Silver Gold Yeah, yeah, at BSG, man. It was on yeah. like a Tuesday night or something. Yeah, yeah that was fun. I, I got casted by Winter at some point. Yeah. I was, oh, man, this is so cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, those were the days, man. Hell yeah. Um, so was there a particular moment when you realized that like StarCraft was going to be really significant in your life? Yeah, so I was at university, I guess, when all of this initially happened about, you know, setting up SC2 Improve and everything. And... Then I started streaming like maybe the year after, so my second year of university, and it was just kind of a casual thing. I just streamed my own tournaments that I made, so I was streaming maybe once or twice a week. But I just really enjoyed it, and I never really took a break from the game, which is something that was very notable. Uh, the only time I took a break was before HOTS launched, because I'm not really into like stuff changing. <laughs> it scared me a little bit, you know? So 
Um, it was kind of like, I guess, my final year of university. I was like, oh, I'm going to try and do like a bigger season of the team league. And then some people actually gave me money to run a tournament, which was like, you guys are crazy. Um, and that was SCT Improved Team League Season 4, uh, which I think Team Liquid went on to win. And it was, it was kind of then because I was like, man, this is a thing. And like, I got my subscription button that year. You know, I was starting to make like $10 off of ad revenue as well. I was like, you know, at the very least, I want to try and make this a thing, go full time when I finish uni. So when I finish my master's, I just went for it. I just said, ah, oh, you know, I t told my parents, I was like, hey, I want to do this for you. Um, you know, I I'd always been very good at school and so on. And I was like, you know, I, I appreciate this a bit off the cuff. It's definitely not like me. He, you know, kind of goes out and overachieves and stuff. But um, I really want to try and do this. And I spent like the first six months traveling and so on. And then because I went to like a bunch of events and then for the next six months I really hunkered down started streaming hardcore and that's when it all really kicked off I guess. Hmm. So how did it feel for you to make the jump from more of a community voice to like a premier level caster? Uh, it's a very interesting one because I feel like I've always just been like a community voice until even when I got my, my first big event which was kind of like I did WSG in 2016 in Brazil about I think 500 people watched that. I don't think I had great viewership. But I did like Shanghai in 2017. I was like, oh, this is it. I'm hired for something, you know, like this is this is my time. I, and it just kind of came. I did it. It went. And I was like, oh, that that was it. Was that for that all? So I kind of just realized that like it was actually just nice to have my stream because I realized these opportunities weren't going to come around a lot. So I guess then while I still got hired for events from there, I would still consider myself a very just community-based figure until I guess like 2020 when I got hired for Katowice, which came at a really good time because I was really casting well at that point. I mean, Harston cast a lot that year, and I had really, I really felt like my game knowledge was on top of uh, on top of things. I was still playing at a pretty high level as well as just coming off of my peak MMR. So I really felt like I got Katowice at a great time, and I think I really nailed it. Like I'd done a bunch of events with WSG and stuff before then. But I would have never have said, like, I came out of an event, I was like, man, I was great. But Katowice, I, I really think I nailed it. And it was the event where we had COVID come up. So didn't get to cast in front of a crowd or anything. But, like, I really came away. And I think everyone felt the same. Like, you know, our StarCraft thread was there, right? Which is never, you know, happen, doesn't happen every day. But also, like, other people from, like, ESL and stuff and, like, Blizzard at the time asked me, like, man, you're really great. And I was like, yeah, like, I, I know it's a bit vain, but, like, I really felt it too. Like, I felt my casting was different that event. I just came at the right time, and from there, it obviously it came into the big online era, and then it just suddenly I was a regular. Like I got hired for absolutely everything since then, which is extremely amazing and fortunate for me. Um, so I, I don't know. Like it just sort of happened. <laughs> to, to answer your question, it just sort of happened. But I would say Katowice was that turning point that one time. Even though I'd done a bunch of events before then, I really felt like I was like the additional like filler space caster, and that was when I became a let's hire this guy fairly regularly guy. And that was kind of interesting because I guess then I still didn't change anything. Like I still grinded online. I still cast all the time. Um, and I guess I was one of the few people still doing that because nowadays I suppose like Roddy casts a lot more. He casts a lot of online stuff, but it's not common for the premier casters to cast stuff online every day. So yeah, it, it, long, long, long answer, but I guess I never really made the full transition, but that was kind of my turning point. Yeah, no, I mean that, that makes perfect sense. And I think the community did recognize that quite a bit. You know, I, I think, um, uh, you know, our StarCraft can be really toxic for a million different reasons, but, but you know, when, when somebody really does put out a good performance, I think they're also pretty good about recognizing it. Yeah, no, I, I like I say, that event was, I, I don't think I've come out of an event feeling that way since, you know, because I really felt like I was in my element, I was able to get hype and like, you know, that's something I really felt like I found at that event that I hadn't found before, like the ability to be comfortable with my co-casters and really just like get excited, shout, bring the energy. I realized like you're here for like four or five days, like you can give it your all, which is such a, you know, one of the big divides that I talk about a lot of kind of online casting and premier level casting, which is like, you can't do that online. If you cast once a week, you can do it, but casting's hard. Like it takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of mental energy and it's a strain on your voice a lot of the time too. And if you do long hours, you can't just shout. Like, I, I've done it before where I got super excited about a really crazy game at the start of the day, and the rest of the day just went downhill. So it's one of those things that I've definitely learned to balance over time, where it's like, you got to know, like, yo, you're in this for the long haul. When you're doing the online cast, you can't just go crazy. I guess that's one of the big things, I guess, I learned from 
cast in the big events where you can bring that energy. You do actually get breaks. You actually can take a chill afterwards, right? And it's only so many matches a day. Um, so I guess that's one of the big things I learned to kind of be a different caster at offline events to what I do online, where I'm still, in a big way, a streamer more than a caster. Yeah, you know, I think it's also, uh, there's an element of online, it comes across as a little bit disingenuous when you hype up things that are not necessarily that hype. Um, yeah. Of course, if there's a great match, that's a different story. But I think even when a match is somewhat mediocre, if it has meaning in, at, a, at a LAN event, it's almost expected that you yeah. hype it up a little bit because you, you're energizing people in front of you. You know what I mean? There, there's energy in the air as opposed to just folks watching from home. I think as well, it's like when you're on, you know, at an event, that's still just the one thing you've got to do. If a match is like, eh, a bit whatever, when you're online, like it's actually a good thing to talk to your chat. It's one of the things I actually think I made a difference when I was just doing community streaming was I always tried to be the serious guy that talked about the games. I, I memed about base trade all the time, being like, oh, they don't talk about the game. You know, some people said that very seriously. I memed with Rifkin a lot about it. But um, like he had the right, they had the right approach of just like being chill and just having a good time because people don't, that's the thing, like people don't necessarily show up for specific, like for the casting. They show up for the community and the feeling of like, hey, this is why I go to hang out. And you know, like it's such a weird divide because like, I'm a streamer, but I'm not a normal streamer because I cast. So I'm a caster, but I'm not a caster when I'm online. I'm a streamer as well. So it's like that balance of casting, but also interacting with chat. And one of the biggest things was when I took a step down from being super serious, trying to always focus online and trying to be more fun and interactive, like the support went up. People, the viewership went up, the support went higher. It's just a different feel that people want. You know, people don't want that professional level broadcast 24 7 like that's almost draining to watch i suppose yeah no i i, I think it is yeah and, and like i said i think that there's just an element of people appreciating when you're just being real and being honest about like how you're feeling mm -hmm. um and i think that that ties into it but um were there any particular moments uh, as a caster where you felt like a bit awestruck like oh wow like i'm casting this player or this particular matchup that was really meaningful for you hmm I think um, the biggest moment I've had like that was probably casting at Katowice in 2022. The last time we had the Spodak, that was my first time casting like out into an arena. And that was like an experience. And I, I was going to cast with Haast and I was doing the semi-final of Hero Marine Raynor. And just before the, like when I woke up, you know, it was, it was a day. Like I hadn't had that feeling in a long time. I was like, man, today we're casting in the arena, you know, like, because it's so sort of slowly like leveled up a little bit, like, you do a studio cast, then you cast with like, you know, the crowd out front, but you're in the back room or whatever, you know? So this was really the moment where I was like, you know, we got to the spo deck and we got to the green room and we went to look to where we were casting. It's like, oh my God, like that's action arena. And I was like starting to get a little bit bouncy and I kind of like hopped, skipped, <laughs> hopped, skipped and jumped like back to the green room. And I can't remember who was, someone was like, whoa, you, you're feeling it today. I was like, yeah, this, this is exciting, you know? And and it was such a great match as well. Like, here Marine goes up 2-0, Reynold brings it back. The games were super tense. It was super close. Um, like, there was just an energy that day. And me and Haasman had been casting a lot, so it was just a great pairing for the day as well. So I guess that was almost like my starstruck feeling. I know it's not necessarily of, like, a certain person or with someone, but I think that's, like, the, man, yeah, like, that was, that was it. Like, that's what I'd been watching for years upon years. And you know, there's just something epic about a setting like that, that we don't get every day in StarCraft. And, you know, we've had great stages. I'm sure it would have been like that to cast at BlizzCon, for example. But I never really did those because I got hired during COVID. And since COVID, our events have been on the smaller scale, right? You know, our best event was probably Atlanta. We casted that online. So, yeah, that was probably my, my Starstruck thing. I also had quite a few cool moments with Bjorn back in the day. Uh, he was a grinder when he started to, like, really grind the Chinese Cups. Um, I don't know if this is necessarily so much starstruck as just like a really cool interaction of like every day Bjorn would like message me because like he was always there and I was always there, you know, he was playing, I was casting every day because he wouldn't do these things all the time. He'd just be like, he'd message me like, thanks for casting the day. I was like, thank you Bjorn, you know, I was like, because players don't usually talk back to you, right, you know? Um, so that was kind of like one of my first cool interactions with like players that I wouldn't usually talk to as well, I suppose. Yeah, no, I think it's really cool to start getting a more casual relationship with people that yeah. otherwise you were like, oh, wow, like this guy, yeah, that's definitely a different thing. But no, I think your, your answer encapsulated my question quite well. It doesn't have to be about a specific person. It was more about the feeling. Hmm. Um, so, you know, when the GSL cuts were announced, you immediately sprang into action and, uh, you know, started producing your Korean Royale. Um, 
What does the Korean StarCraft II community mean to you? I think the Korean StarCraft community just means excellence, right? Like that is our pinnacle and our peak, or at least it was for a long time. Um, nowadays, I think you'd be wrong to say Korea is the best region. Uh, some people will complain about that, but you know, the Koreans are very good and maybe the Korean has the best, highest level of depth, but the Europeans are obviously very good. We've got a Chinese world champion right now. It's not dominant like it was, but there's like a level of prestige in Korea. And Korea has obviously had a lot of rough times. There's been a lot of times where Korea has maybe been a little bit underloved. They've had some, you know, bad things happen over there. And you can tell the player base struggles, you know, it gets smaller and it gets smaller. You know, every single time I start running a tournament, like I used to run Korean only tournaments. That's not really a thing now because it's just almost important to get like a 16 player Korean event. You need like every single Korean player to like say yes. And that's like very difficult to do. Um, so yeah, for me, the Korean scene, it's, it's very important because it's got so much history in StarCraft 2. Um, I, I think that's what it means. It's just like, it is that prestige. It is that level. It sets the bar for everyone else to really level up and to aim for and to kind of get there. Um, and while it's maybe not sad that the Korean scene is going because a lot of it is players just realizing, hey, I can move on and do other things with my life. You know, military takes a lot of players out and that's just very difficult to come back from. It's just sad that there's nothing there to kind of get people to come back anymore, right? Um, so I think it's important to do what you can to help the Koreans out. They've given us so many years of great StarCraft 2. If we can keep them going and keep them afloat a little bit longer or just keep everyone like, even if they just, you know, it just makes the difference of, hey, like, you know, I have to take a part-time job, but it's only part-time because we've got a couple extra events to plan. I think that stuff's really important. So anything we can do for Korea, and that's why I don't really run region locked events anymore because sometimes I run stuff in the European time zone. So it just makes sense for the EU server, but I'd very rarely run like a, really heavily EU focused tournament or so nowadays. Um, obviously Korean Royale is a bit of a special one in that regard, but I just try and do everything open because I want to give everyone the chance to play on things because I think everyone needs chances to play on things nowadays. Yeah, no, every opportunity means a lot to these guys. So what would you say is the most challenging part of that turn tournament organization for you? Yeah, <laughs> there's too many tournaments, man. <laughs> like, it, it, it's funny because I used to, I guess it's finding the balance of like when to run a tournament and when not to. Because it used to be that you could just always run tournaments because A, they're a bit smaller, so it was less important if I like maybe something else was over the top of mine. Nowadays, I feel like I've got like a level where I've leveled up with prize money. I don't run smaller events anymore. Where I used to run a $100 cup, now it's like three, dollars $400. And so it's more important now than ever before for me to like go out and say, hey, look, like this is a good event. Let's get it somewhere. It's not going to interact with other things. But especially since COVID, a lot of people realized how you can run StarCraft tournaments online. And a lot of people that ran offline events before moved stuff online that then they realized they could do over more days. So the schedule's just gotten busier and busier and busier. And it is just a battle to try and find any sort of free time. And I've turned down probably twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars of sponsorships this year because people want to sponsor events, but it's impossible to find a time. And it's not necessarily to, impossible to find a time that like you could do a day here and a day there, but to like find a week and be like, hey, this is this tournament this week, that's basically impossible because there's WTL three days a week, there's Kung Fu Cup on one day. The Mondays are just gone because they're ESL Open Cups as well. So I mean, <laughs> you've got to overlap with WTL at the very least if you want to run on a weekend. So yeah, scheduling is, is just tough and it's just because there's so much online stuff, which is great, you know, stuff like WTL is extremely important and it's amazing that we have it. It's just now finding that balance of like, hey, I'm happy overlapping with WTL. And it's weird because like in a way we can, because the, even if the players are playing the same day, we're at this point now where we work so regularly with the same guys, that we, they understand like, hey, if you want to play WTL, that's fine. I'll pause my tournament for like a, a bit or I'll rearrange the matches so you shouldn't overlap. As long as you're happy going from this tournament to that tournament, that's kind of fine. And that's kind of the place we're at where running online tournaments kind of has to like, interlap with each other a little bit otherwise there's just no chance to run them and like i say it's just it's nigh on impossible to just get like a week straight where you can be the tournament that's on um and that's probably the biggest challenge because like it'd be nice to have some more of those because we could have had some cool events this year that specifically the sponsor just said hey we want it over six days or seven days one week only they they don't like the tuesday here and a wednesday two weeks later which is what i can do with my events which is why my events still go on because I don't really mind, you know, I, I, you know, for me, it's a filler day, right? I fill in a day of streaming. It's another day of work that I can do. So 
And I would say that's the biggest challenge. Like there's actually just a lot of Starcraft going on. Yeah, it's something I've heard a lot from people that, that are trying to host like new things and it sounds really, really challenging. Um, but honestly, that's, uh, it's not, that's not the worst uh, no, news ever. No, it's a good thing. Obviously, like, I mean, if, if your biggest problem is like overscheduling, then yeah, you, you can't really complain about that. It's, it's just definitely interesting that it was because of like COVID where suddenly everyone realized we can run stuff online. So beforehand, what would have been like, hey, Wednesday people fly, Thursday they get there, Friday, Saturday, Sunday they play there, everyone's home Tuesday. That's maybe like a, hey, over four weeks now, these two days are blocked out. And so that's, that's definitely been a big change over the last couple of years. It's also a tremendous amount of money that gets freed up, not paying for a venue, not paying for flights. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So. And the viewership is usually, as long as you like promote it well and you get out there and like people know what you're doing, it's really comparable, you know? And especially with the production you can do nowadays with player cams and stuff that's become a norm. That's really, you can bring a lot of the same experience, you know, outside of obviously we have lag and stuff, we have different servers, but you can still see very good StarCraft with the best players in the world in a, you know, an online setting. Absolutely. <clears throat> so, you know, oftentimes you, you cast for a lot of hours in a row. You're live for like half a day some, a lot of times, right? You know, do you have any particular like dark horse players that you have casted a lot that you think like this guy's due for a breakout? Ooh, it's kind of it's kind of an interesting one because I feel like the guys that I felt like that about were kind of like they're sort of breaking out already. You know, I'd say like a player like Mixu, for example, is the sort of player who in the last year or so has really started to step up, and people are now more familiar with his name than they were before. A player like Nightmare a couple of years ago, someone we've seen in online tournaments for a long time, he really stepped up, suddenly he's in GSL, suddenly he's actually like a competitor. Zaun was a very similar name a few years ago as well. I think it's um, a lot of these guys really have kind of stepped up and kind of, you know, come through and that, you know, names now, which when I make a list of players to invite to a tournament, I'm like, yeah, I can put these names down that I wouldn't have put down before. Um, it's actually one thing that I, I don't really do as much anymore is I don't cast as many open events. Um, or if I do, like, you know, you do one open event, but like there's 32 players, but you only cast two of them for the first round and then the dark horses are kind of gone. So it's one thing I'm less out of touch with. I know Roddy would probably list off about seven different players on, you know, in, in two seconds um, because he's really into that aspect of StarCraft, where I guess I focus more on kind of continuing to support the guys already at the top. And it's definitely something I try and do better about. This year we did a lot of open cups, like monthly open cups, to try and, you know, for me to kind of see like who wants to play in things rather than just me being like, hey, you want to play this, you want to play that? Like just saying, hey, look, here's a good prize pool, come out and play. And I always use that kind of aspect with my qualifiers as well. Like for me, a qualifier is, you know, for my events, I use it as like a way to see who's interested in playing. You know, if you sign up to two of the qualifiers and maybe you just hit round a 16 top four qualifier, but if you sign up to both, like you're pretty highly likely to get invited. You know, um, so like in a way, the qualifier is a formality, but it's also like a check to be like, hey, if you're out there playing StarCraft, like show me, you know, like because I don't keep up with these guys as much as I probably should otherwise. There's a lot of people to keep up with. <laughs> there is, yeah. <laughs> so you've been heavily involved in the testing of the new maps through your, uh, you know, TLMC tournaments. What keeps you so interested and engaged with like that part of the scene? Just think it's very important. Um, I really have the tools to be able to do something useful for them, which is to get the maps out there and to be played. And so I just think it's important, right? Because otherwise, if these maps don't get played, people don't get a feel for them, then... And not just that, but like the community doesn't get to see them at all. I, I just think it's important that there's some process there, because even for the map makers, like, it's funny because like, you have these tournaments and so often it comes around, and even the players who played them don't remember these maps when they come onto ladder, right? And they're like, whoa, how the heck's this here? Well, you guys played and you didn't say anything about it. But I think it's most important for the map makers because for them it's A, cool to see people playing on their maps even if they don't make ladder, which such a small percentage of them do. And it's just a great opportunity for them to learn something, to get feedback, which helps them to keep on making great maps, which is obviously super important for StarCraft, right? So it's almost like a long-term investment. Like we need the map makers and, and anything we can do to make map makers better or to give them more opportunities or more chances or to, you know, ways to learn. I think the tournament does a lot to do that. So. I'd say the tournament is there, obviously the TLMC happens and the TLMC asked me to do the tournament, but that's why I'm still really interested in doing it because it is just fun, it's a bit different, and even if maybe they don't get the best feedback from players, I think it is still important for the map makers especially to be able to be like, hey look, like this is what we can do from this, and 
I think that's been very important over time because you've seen how maps have picked up on certain things and a lot of names from back in the day that you'd see every now and then now have like four maps in the, like the top 16 or something, you know? So it's just been something that's been cool to kind of be a part of for a long time. And, you know, I think it's an important part of StarCraft. Most well, definitely is, yeah. It's, it's, you know, a huge part of the variety, you know, of the games is so heavily map-based. And, you know, in doing a bit of research for this, uh, you know, I didn't realize you've been doing that for six years now. That's, yeah. It's a long time. Yeah, no, it's, um, it is actually kind of crazy to think back about because I guess that's 2017, which was for me as well when it was a couple of years into being full time, but I definitely was by no means the biggest streamer out there. Like I ran tournaments, but mostly smaller ones. So for me, the map contest was like, you know, we got the, the prize money off Blizzard back then. So for me, it was a chance to run a big tournament that I wouldn't get to run every day as well, right? But I really threw that, fell in love with that process. So yeah, it has been a long time and I just feel like it's something that we do, you know, that's, that's something that happens. It'd be a massive shame that T if TLMC ever stopped. I know they've got to cut back on funding and uh, you know, we've amazingly had Monster sponsor the last one. I think they're sponsoring the upcoming one as well. So uh, those things are amazing because, you know, Team Liquid are also fighting through and doing everything they can to keep the maps coming. and. I think any support towards that's very important because especially nowadays, you know, we've got a nine map map pool. We're finally freeing up the map pool and doing different things more than ever before. We need like fun ideas because we finally have a chance to have fun ideas. You know, something that was so constraining before was you had seven maps. So if you have a weird one, it's just vetoed every time. And then it decides a world championship or something in game yeah. seven, right? Now with nine maps, there's that little bit more freedom. You can have a couple crazier ones. The players are more open to it. And you have more chances for maps like Golden Wall in the past to like come back through and be like, hey, this map's kind of weird, but we like it. Like, look at Raduset. Like, this is a map which I would have never said belongs to the map pool. And maybe I still don't love it that much, but it has seen play. It doesn't get vetoed every time. And we've seen some cool games on it. And it's not my kind of StarCraft. I don't like the big can't really attack stuff, but it's different. And every series right now feels very different because players are so much more adventurous with maps. So. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's cool to see how the evolution of maps has come along because there's definitely a few TLMCs where it was like, you took a map, you rotated it 90 degrees, you overlaid it on the map that's currently in the ladder and it's the same map with a different color set, you know? Like, th that's definitely happened a few times and there's only so much creativity you can do when everyone expects standard to be the standard, you know? So, yeah, it's cool to see how the maps have developed over these years. Most definitely. I think it's particularly important now with Blizzard not in active development of the game anymore, this is kind of a one way we can shake things up outside of the rare patches that we see. Yeah, no, it, it's definitely something we have so much control over because while we maybe can't change the ladder maps all the time, like if we wanted to just run a different map in a tournament, we could do. And if the players wanted to, they could practice that in customs. You know, a lot of players play customs. You know, the ladder's not as active as it's ever been. So customs are more and more important. So we're probably in the best place ever to start doing that. So it's definitely a great way to keep things very interesting, very fresh. I mean, people love it when there's new maps. You know, it's the talk of the talk of the town yeah. when uh, maps come around. So, yeah, very exciting every time we get the map pool updated. Most definitely. So, have you been surprised at the level of support that the StarCraft community shows for crowdfunding campaigns like yours and the GSLs, among others? Uh, kind of yes and no, because no, because our community is awesome. <laughs> I guess at this point we've seen it so many times, right? Uh, even if you go way back, like Bay Street TV probably did one of the first crowdfunding events for StarCraft back when they did the Hell It's a Boot Time tournament in Canada, wherever it was, Vancouver. Toronto, maybe. I think. Toronto, it was in Toronto. Yeah, whichever one it was. Somewhere in Canada, there was a Bay Street TV event. Um, but yeah, people came out in droves for that, you know, like people support. So it's, it's always been there, maybe not even tapped into enough. I do think it's important we don't over tap into it because obviously there's a big difference between sort of like, you know, doing this once and then doing it like every single time there's a tournament. I know, for example, like when Match Arena first came around, Match Arena was this cool system to be like, hey, you like the games today? Give the players a few extra dollars. But that sort of felt like to me, like every single event was like, had a Match Arena page. And it was like, you know, a lot of the time the Match Arena page was just there to sort of be like, yo, please give us some money. And so I took a bit of a step back from that approach and then, yeah, I mean, so to bring it back, I suppose, in a way, no, because like we've seen it's always been there, but it's still amazing to see this laid into the game's life that people are so supportive. And, you know, it's interesting StarCraft because we have a demographic that do have jobs a lot of the time, that do have like stability in their lives. They do have that excess money to put into their hobbies and put into their passion. So we have that kind of older kind of age of viewers that 
maybe can support that a little bit further. So like I say, it's, it's always surprising because it's amazing to see it. You never take that for granted, but it, it does sort of make sense. And, you know, we're a game that everyone knows, everyone loves. There's nothing really like it out there on the market. So it really is something I think people want to keep on seeing. And if they are given those opportunities in responsible and kind of meaningfully placed out ways, then I think it's great. Um, for me specifically, the cast of Civil War was just incredible. I mean, we got like 30, 25 to 30,000 or so raised. And I think just to see how quickly everybody picked it up, you know, I mean, I played the trailer on my channel and the link went out in the chat. And by the time the trailer had finished, we had like $4,000. It's like, guys, you didn't even read what it's about. Like you just literally put some money on a Kickstarter. Um, but it's just amazing to know that if you want to try and go out there and put some extra work into something, but you need money to do it, that if you make it good, the community will be there to help it. And that just means that as a creator, the doors are open, you know, you want to do something fun. If you go out there, put the time in, put the investment in initially, you're probably going to see love and support for it. So that's really, really awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, especially <clears throat> with like, you know, tournaments like that got funded your Korean Royale, but then also the crowdfunding for the GSL and KSL as well, you know, it, it really kept the Korean scene alive, right? Like the Korean scene, scene looked to be in its death throes and now, now you know, it's not the healthiest scene in the world, but it, it definitely more viable. Yeah, no, it, it just shows how much people want to see the Korean StarCraft, right? And I mean, it sort of shows as well, it's like GSL, take our money, please, you know, sell us a GSL mouse pad or something after all of these years, right? Um, because people are literally happy to just give you money to exist. People would be even happier to buy things, you know? So I think it's a massive, I actually think, uh, I talked about this with a few other people, but GSL has, has felt very mismanaged for a long time because it's, it could have done so much more. Like it has great viewership. They've never once attempted to tap into any sort of money with the foreign scene. Like they could have had a sponsor from the foreign scene. Yeah. If they have one person at GSL that sends out, like, spends a week sending emails, they would absolutely have a sponsor per season for GSL, which may not be bank breaking amounts, but it's the difference, right? If, if you're just kind of hoping to survive the next year along, then, then that could have made the difference. Like the foreign viewership's been very good. Like I know it, like my viewership's like 10% of GSLs and I have people that want to come out and sponsor things and be on the channel, right? Uh, GSL really could have done more it's good to see that they're finally doing something and taking money and, and doing what they can. But uh, GSL in a way was like a massively missed opportunity in a lot of ways. And uh, hopefully they continue, if it does go on next year, hopefully they do continue to tap in with, you know, crowdfunding, but even just like merch, right? Like we've, people have asked for merch for a long time. I do genuinely think people would just sponsor it as well. Like it's got, it's got such a strong brand name that there are so many companies that would absolutely dive at the opportunity to be affiliated with GSL. And that's really not a bad thing. So hopefully someone out there can do something with that because I think there's still a lot of untapped potential in GSL. This drives me crazy. <laughs> I, I, I've talked to a bunch of people about this in videos and outside of videos, and I can't even wrap my mind around it to a certain extent. You know, one thing that really even amped up this feeling more so was when I interviewed uh, Trevor Houston, who's like the uh, you know torch uh, yeah. head of esports at Frost Giant. He, he, he mentioned to me that uh, the 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 ad or sorry the, the the revenue that was generated from charging for the GOM TV stream back in the day was actually apparently a pretty significant source of mm -hmm. revenue for them, and of course that's not really like a normal model anymore, but but still it, it just shows that like at that time at least the people in charge understood that that the foreign audience was the big audience and and that was a fantastic way to monetize it. Um, and yeah, it is mind blowing that, you know, especially when you look at the, the sponsorships that they do acquiesce these days, it's all only Korean domestic yeah. and it makes no sense. Why would a Korean domestic company, you know, make a significant, uh, advertising contribution to a, a viewer base that can't even participate in what they're advertising? I, I understand it to the extent of like, obviously if, you know, GSL is by Africa, that Korean focus, but like. You're at the point where like you would make money hiring someone to be in charge of like foreign affairs with GSL, right? Absolutely. Like you, you would have like, cause it's not a full-time job, but if you pay someone for like, you know, two months of the year, three months of the year that GSL is on to be, you know, their job to market it and whatever else, it, it would have been a profit even if you pay someone, even if you don't yourself. I mean, maybe it's complicated because of Freaker have different things, but like as a company, as a Freaker, like you're in a position to actually go out there and do something like that, right? Like you're in the position to make that move. So yeah. 
I think it's baffling the more. I didn't ever really thought about it until someone brought it up to me. I was like, man, it really is baffling. No one, you know, how I know things about how it all works. I'm like, it doesn't really make sense. You know, like GSL shouldn't have ever really had money issues. They have such a loyal audience, has such a loyal viewership. Like they could sell so much of whatever they wanted to. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. Um, I mean, there's been stories of GSL as well where people want to cast GSL, like uh, the Chinese scene, I believe, want to cast GSL, and then they're like, hey, if you want the rights to cast GSL, it's this amount of money. And the Chinese guys are like, okay, we'll just go run our own GSL because that's how much money they're asking for. So it's like, it, it, the approach is definitely not being correct, I think, for a long time there. Yeah, they just seem very disconnected from that product. I mm. think they don't understand I, that product. I wonder if it, at some point it just could have been, it sort of was just like, a, oh, we'll just do this another year. We'll just keep it going as like a thing. You know, we already have the Africa studio and we already have like the guys who are on contracts. So they'll come in and work the day, right? So why not just keep it on for another year and another year? And then and like, they like never really felt the need to do anything more. And then it was like, huh. We're really gonna have to stop this. Maybe finally it's, you know, so maybe it's just something like that where it was never their goal and they just kept it going and then someone didn't actually wanna let it die so they did something. Uh, either way, like you say, when you look at the big picture, it's, it's kind of crazy. Especially with the VOD viewership as well. Like every, every video has got like 100K views. Mm -hmm. That might be a slight exaggeration, but it's near there. Um, so yeah, it's a bit baffling, but we can, we can move on from there. <laughs> So, you know, with the announcement of StarCraft II at DreamHack Dallas and the presumed presence of StarCraft II at the Esports World Cup in Riyadh, um, StarCraft seems to be on a bit of an upswing for the first time in a long time. Um, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, at the start of this last year, they said the World Championship will be at least 200,000. And now we're finding out that Katowice is 500,000 and that's not the World Championship. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing to be said, but StarCraft's on an upswing. Players are being picked up by teams. Apparently, they're getting contracted for more than just a year. So people are believing in StarCraft. Like, these big teams are picking up players. Like I say, they're getting contracted for a good amount of time. This is not just like, hey, let's see how this goes. These are serious things. Um, so yeah, I think StarCraft is picking up some momentum and picking up some love, which it deserves, man. Like, there's a reason people are still out here watching it. Like, people are going to stop sleeping on it at some point. You've seen a lot of games kind of come and go. And maybe they don't necessarily go all the way, but like sort of like StarCraft. StarCraft came and it went, but we're still like five, six, seven years down the line from that, right? And it's like, I think a lot of people are realizing like, right, there's still, there's still something there. So yeah, it's, it's great to see. Um, it's fantastic that players know they've got stuff to play in for the next few months at the very least. And with news like that, you would imagine it's gonna continue for time to come. And obviously if it didn't, you know, we're in a position to try and do as much as we can to help StarCraft anyway, but yeah, I think definitely nothing but good news in the last couple of months. Totally in agreement. So, you know, transitioning away from uh, just, just discussing StarCraft, uh, you know, what are your expectations for Stormgate? Um, I don't really know what to think for Stormgate right now. Um, I followed it a lot early on and um, kept up to date with everything, but it's very tough to keep putting time into keeping up to date with something when you can't go out there and talk about it. Yeah. Um, it's very difficult like it's very frustrating to be able to be like hey guys I played it and it was fun uh, or it's just something like that you know what I mean like yeah. so I've kind of stepped back a little bit from it not necessarily in a sense of like oh it doesn't interest me just in like I'm going to keep focusing on what I can do because it's still work um, that's the kind of weird balance that I'm at where it's like if I want to go and play the Stormgate Alpha for five hours that that's kind of like a crossover into work for me like that's not really me like going out and playing a game for five hours like it's a very different vibe because that to me is work time but then f to do that for five hours where i can't stream and then i can't really talk about it and honestly i think everything will change by the time i can stream or talk about it yeah it just doesn't necessarily seem like a good investment of time so i played a few hours here and there um when the first when each of the alphas came out and so on i'll be checking out the beta a little bit when it comes out soon um but other than that great team of people and I think they've got potential to do great things so I'm excited for it but uh, I'm gonna wait until I can stream it until I can really dive in deep yeah I, I think that's the sentiment I've heard from a lot of people like we're excited but yeah it is very difficult to especially if this is your profession to invest time into it when you can't see any short-term you know benefit yeah um, it's, it's, it's especially because it's not like it's not like you just want to jump on the cash cow when it arrives it's just like what do I gain from being more involved right now you know like 
not a lot in a way like I think it's important to still show up to the talks and the, the community discussions they have and stuff so I try my best to be there when I can but uh, in terms of actually like going out and being like right I'm going to hammer Stormgate for like 10 hours a day that 10 hours is not going to have any impact <laughs> whenever we can play the game on stream or so so yeah just trying to be responsible with my time spent no that, that, that absolutely makes sense so what about Zero Space? Any thoughts? Uh, any, any ideas? Yeah, I love Zero Space. I actually got to stream some Zero Space. <clears throat> when they first announced it, we did a little show match, a little, little tournament. Very cool. Obviously, it's great to see something. I think what was surprising for me is I heard a couple of people out now and again be like, oh yeah, Katz asked me to come play test a game he's making. I'm like, okay, right, cool. And then like, you know, he sent me a message. He's like, hey, we're, we're going live with this crowdfunder and we're making a game. And you click on this Kickstarter and you're like, oh my God, like it looks good, you know? Um, so I was very impressed just with how much they'd come along. Obviously, super interesting. I know a lot of people talked about this, but the, the difference in marketing techniques of like Stormgate, who've hyped us up before we've seen anything versus Zero Space that show up and be like, bam, this is what we've got. I think very cool. I think again, great team of people. They've got some great ideas. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see how it panned out. Uh, I could obviously talk a bit more about Zero Space because I always streamed it a bit, but Love playing it, thought it was very fun, thought a lot of the ideas were very cool and unique. So I can only be excited to see a little bit more. How do you think these various RTSs will coexist with each other and StarCraft? Yeah, it's a great question. I think the best way to look at it is almost how does StarCraft exist with RTSs from before? And it's like, you know, Warcraft 3 still has a scene, right? Warcraft 3 still has players that just like Warcraft 3. AoE has a scene and it's just our AoE players. It really depends how big each of them are. Uh, I think there's going to be a leader. I don't think it's necessarily going to be like one game or two games stand alongside each other. Is like I think there's going to be one game that really stands out as like this is the current RTS, and whether that's StarCraft still and Stormgate and Zero Space have smaller scenes, or if it's Stormgate and the other two, have, I think that's going to be how it goes. I think there's going to be one game that really takes the big RTS audience pull. I think if that's not StarCraft, StarCraft will still have a significant viewership. Uh, if it's you know, if it's not Stormgate or Zero Space that don't take the big pull, then it'll be interesting to see how they handle it and how they develop it from there because that's obviously going to be tough being a newer game that doesn't have some, you know what I mean? Like, it's hard to imagine that the newer game is going to have like a sustainably smaller viewership versus if they make the push and become the big thing. So I, these games can coexist though, uh, obviously. I mean, like I say, Warcraft 3 still has tournaments and events and still has some bigger ones as well. So... Um, I think the main thing I would say right now is that for sure StarCraft's not going anywhere. Um, even if StarCraft 2 is not the big pro scene that's funded by ESL, we're still going to have StarCraft events, we're still going to have some great StarCraft matches, so I think that's the main thing that a lot of people want to know about. So, Absolutely, yeah, no, I'm uh, very much in agreement. Yeah, I, I think um, for sure uh, it seems very likely that one will emerge as, as the front runner, and but no matter what happens, I don't think Starcraft's going to go anywhere, um, and you know maybe you see reductions eventually. Yeah, I don't know, but but uh, will the game go away? Doesn't seem likely. Um, so, are, are you surprised to see this like sort of reinvigorated interest in in RTS? Um, I guess not really, because I, I think RTS is a really cool genre, um, so I think it it definitely deserves it. Uh, I, I guess not, because honestly, I feel as though had things been different with Blizzard and StarCraft 2, we wouldn't have ever really needed a reinvigoration, you know? I think RTS games really suffer from the current model of the gaming industry, which is to rush something out into early access and then to try and make something happen from there. Like, teams have been, you know, kind of dealt bad hands where it's like, hey, make this game, but you must get it out by this time. And for a lot of like smaller games or indie games or like platformers or just other genres, that can really work, you know, because it can still be fun to play while it's not quite perfect. But in RTS, especially when we've had one as crisp as StarCraft 2 for a long time, it doesn't work like that. And it's very complicated. So there's been some great games. I mean, I've been hearing Take TV in the last couple of years to cast A Year of Rain, which was a really fun game. It was really cool. They had a couple of pathfinding issues. And so they were like, okay, we're going to work on that. But the problem is, they were forced into early access, the pathfinding wasn't great. So then a lot of people don't keep playing it. But then they have to try and get people to keep playing it, right? And then as the publisher says, sees, hey, there's not enough people playing the game. And they're like, oh yeah, well, we're trying to fix something. The publisher's like, oh, we'll fix it now. And they're like, it's gonna take a while. And then, boom, they get cut. Game's over, right? That's happened to a bunch of RTS games lately. 
And I think that's just RTS suffering from the current way the industry works because it's so normal now to be like, oh, you're going to make a not finished game and put it out. So that's why I was kind of excited about like a Stormgate, right? Because it's a team that had like big investments. They didn't have to necessarily rush something out. I think for me, that's one of the things that was most exciting because to actually have the time to go out there and build something and also to have the, obviously the hype of the community so that even if it doesn't splash straight away, people are still going to stick by it for a little while. I think that's what other RTS games have struggled with. So I feel like we've kind of needed these couple of games to come around that have a bit more support for RTS to really see success. And like I say, if things were different with StarCraft 2 and Blizzard, maybe we would have already been seeing a StarCraft 3 being made, and I think that would have been a big hit anyway, right? So yeah, I think it's just like a combination of all those things that kind of put RTS here in the first place. So as, as many of your fans you know, are aware, you're, you're pretty involved in a couple other games than just StarCraft. Um, so I think let's talk about the first of them uh, being Pokemon. So, you know, what kind of participation do you have in the Pokemon community? So Pokemon for me was like a, a kind of an outlet from StarCraft for a while where I didn't have a great 2019. And so I got really into Pokemon Go as like a way to step away from the PC a little bit and to go out and do other things. And I kind of, I was like, I loved Pokemon as a kid and stuff. And for me, it really re like revitalized what I loved about it and just so it was very cool. So for me, it was very important because I was in a pretty bad place with StarCraft at that point. You know, I was kind of frustrated I wasn't getting hired for events. Like I was trying to make a big push. The stream wasn't maybe as good as I thought it could have been. And you know, when you just start negative, like it keeps on carrying on. So I played Pokemon Go as like a big like outlet to that and just kind of fell in love with the franchise again. So for me, it was almost the first thing that in a lot of years I'd enjoyed outside of StarCraft because my life had been StarCraft and especially building up, you know, you feel like you got to do 12 hour day after 12 hour day after 12 hour day. So for me, it was really something where I could get out, enjoy it, and then more so than just Pokemon Go, I kind of got into the guard cards again. Obviously, I was like, huh, you can actually like buy things and put them in the background, like plushies and stuff. So I just kind of really fell in love with that aspect of having something to love once more. Um, that was just a bit fresh and new. Um, and since then, as a competitive person, I, I was collecting cards, and I was like, man, it'd be fun to kind of like learn to play cards. And for me, now, the trading card game is a really fun chance to go and like get away from a computer, because everything's on a computer in this day and age, especially if you live and die by StarCraft and streaming and stuff. It's really hard to get away from a computer, and especially to get away from a computer in like a relaxation sort of way. Like, as, you know, or at least from away from a screen, you know, or to like even just like not look at my phone for a little while and not look at which player has accidentally double scheduled an event. Being able to like go out and like sit across the table from someone and play some cards is like a real, just different vibe and just very chill and relaxing. So being very into that and travel to a few events just to play in tournaments, just because I'm competitive. <laughs> um, haven't traveled as much this last year for it because they, they, they kind of brought back like the local scene. Uh, Pokemon has this really cool system where it's like locals, then regionals, which is like in different countries, then internationals, and then the world championship. And so the locals being really cool is, is really nice because you can go out and like you can play local and you can earn points that can get you to a world championship just with like your local game store and stuff. So it's a really cool system that like goes all the way down. If StarCraft was any bigger, it'd be really cool to make something similar. It's kind of like 2012 WCS where it was like the UK qualifier, then it was the European tournament and then it was like the Worlds, right? Yeah. Uh, but with like one stage below that where it was like like say in like America, right, you had like the California qualifier or like the New York qualifier, you know, like qualifiers by states. Um, so it's just a really cool system. So I haven't traveled as much because the local stuff came back because uh, they had it on pause from COVID. So I've just been getting my fix from just playing locally. So yeah, um, obviously I've got a lot of Pokemon plushies and stuff in the background. I have a lot of Pokemon stuff in general. Um, I'm a bit of a collector, I suppose. I like uh, having things. I like collecting things. I like looking at things. It makes me happy. Um, it's very difficult to do that with StarCraft. I did with Blizzard things for a while, but I fell out of love with a lot of Blizzard stuff. Um, so I still love all my like StarCraft memorabilia, but you can't really keep buying that. So I guess in a way, Pokemon kind of filled that gap as well. That's an interesting perspective. I didn't really think about it from the you know like physical collection you know sort of uh, sort of uh, perspective. Um, and that's a really cool system, like what you just described. Is, uh, you know, I feel like that doesn't exist in Magic the Gathering, which is kind of... Um, yeah. That seems like it would be a great system for that game. Yeah, no, it, it's just really cool. It means that you can choose what you want to do. Like, if you want to aim for your world invite, you're going to have to travel a bunch. But if you just want to, like, play somewhat competitively, 
you can play in your local stuff. You can win a you know, you can win a play mat that says champion on it. That's like by season and stuff. You can win some packs. You know, you get prize packs for participating, and then. You know, if you want to like just go to your local regional, you can do, and that's like your step up, like that's your championship in a way. So you can kind of make your championship whatever you want. I think it's really cool because it's so accessible. Like you can go and just be bad and it's completely fine and there's something for you to play in and you can still have success and fun there, you know? So whereas in StarCraft, like if you're not at the tip to the top, it's really tough. Uh, I mean, you look at some of the $50 cups and you look at the names you have to beat to earn $5, it's like, oh my God, like you got to put like thousands of hours in to be good enough, right? So yeah, I think it's a really cool system that definitely promotes people just, you know, it's easy to step up, you know, to get into it. Most definitely. So the other game um, that you seem to be pretty invested in and you've uh, gotten poor Loco quite reinvested in is, uh, is, is RuneScape. So what... What keeps you uh, engaged and involved with that game? Um, so RuneScape, I play old school RuneScape, which is like a release of the two th a re-release of the two thousand and seven state of the game. It's kind of interesting. So when I was at university, well, basically TLDR and RuneScape they ruined the game. Like they kind of made it like it used to be like a point and click game, and they tried to update it to be like more of like a modern day MMO. And a lot of people like really didn't like that. It wasn't the same game, and it also had microtransaction issues. But it, for once, it wasn't even the microtransactions. Like they are bad, but like it was actually the way they changed the game that ruined it. So a lot of people just quit and for a long time there's private servers and stuff and then in 2013 I think it was because it was 10 years ago uh, they were like hey if you guys really want to see it like you know there's a there's a like a petition here the more like people that sign up the more uh, you know support we'll give it. And so they ended up releasing what they call old school RuneScape which was a relaunch of the 2007 version of the game and What's really, really cool about it is, I, so I played that since launch. When it first came out, I actually raced to 99 farming, which a 99 is like the highest level. It takes a lot of hours. Um, farming's a bit of a weird one because like it's time gated as well. So I spend a lot of my university days waking up at a certain time to make sure my trees were okay. <laughs> as weird as that is. Um, so I raced to 99 farming, I got second place. And it's like a very cool memory for me, like something I just did in my gaming life. Um, and so I've played it since then, like on and off, it's the sort of game sometimes you step away from and sometimes you get back to. Um, but what's been really cool is that the game was kind of, it was being updated a little bit, but they really realized they had a player base. And there was like an initial drop off and it kind of looked like the game was not in so good of a place. And then they like revitalized it a bit, they made some bigger changes. And now it's like one of the bigger MMOs out there. And it has like five times the player base of the actual current, like the modern RuneScape. Um, so it's really cool to have seen that be successful because well, I think RuneScape really has that other games don't is like progress. Like if you play WoW, if you sit out for a patch, well, the moment a patch drops, all your gear is irrelevant again. Like it's relevant for your first clear of the raid or for the first week, and it's all irrelevant or it can all be replaced, you know? Whereas in RuneScape, if you get an item, like you can use that forever. Like, some items aren't always going to be useful, but like generally like progress is progress. Like there's not really anything that wipes out previous progress and there's like stepping stones of like, hey, I can afford this or I can afford that. So it's a really like satisfying game where it's like, I would have put some hours in. If I put some hours in today and I don't go back for three weeks, in three weeks it'll still be meaningful, you know? Um, whereas in three weeks and wow, like everyone has better gear and you, you'd be left behind the dust or something. Hmm. So it's like a really cool way to like, sort of like progress personally and it's just a really cool game because there's so many ways to play. Um, you can click and just not look at the screen and, and do certain things like that or you can like you know they've got raids and stuff now and bosses which is quite mechanically demanding and like it's almost like a rhythm game because it works on like a tick system where every 0.6 seconds it takes in an action hmm. so there's like a lot of rhythm of like patterns of like you know one two three four then do this and you know count and stuff so there's something just really satisfying about it. And I just love all parts of it. Like I love the laid back part. I used to always, for me, it was kind of a weird way to get away from when I was studying. I was like, I'd have it like on my screen while I was studying and like every two minutes, just looking up and clicking, like reset my concentration. So I'd just be able to study all day for whatever reason that really works for me. So it's just a game I really love. I, I could talk about it for a very long time. Um, it's the sort of game which people look at and they're like, some people just don't get it. I, I completely get that. Um, but from someone who played it, way back when and seeing kind of how it's come, it's, it's really cool. So yeah, it's not definitely not for everyone. I know not everyone's gonna love it, but for me, it's, it's the one game I really play anymore. Um, it really is my relaxation time. It really is what I just enjoy. 
Um, I think part of that as well is I'm not big on single player games, but then to play multiplayer games, sometimes I just get busy, so I can't play as much. So like, you know, it's very difficult to keep up in like a WoW or something like that. So it really just kind of scratches that itch in a good way. Yeah, no, I, I remember dedicating like <clears throat> several weeks out of the summer to a wood cutting school case. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Looking back on it feels like such a silly way to like spend time, but also it, it, it was rewarding and it, it yeah. was really fun to have that like badge of honor. Um, yeah, it's a fun game. I, uh, but I think that that's about all I have prepared for you. Uh, so any closing words? I just, thanks for talking to me. Obviously shout out to StarCraft community. I think uh, it's really amazing that so many people just keep showing up to things and keep on tuning in and watching. Uh, and that goes from like viewers to players as well. Players are super great nowadays. Like everyone's really good at like just kind of being awesome and not making life difficult as much as they used to. So uh, just shout out to everyone really. Um, it's great to be here and it's great to keep on doing StarCraft. Hell yeah, dude. Thanks for the time. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this one, be sure to leave a like and drop a comment down below. If you don't want to miss out on future releases with other amazing RTS people, get subscribed. If you really love my work and you want another way to support me, consider contributing to my Patreon. The link is in the video description. Until next time, friends.